Oh, and students, if you could uh, get your videos on, please. Welcome. This is the, the previous the Phoebus Ethics of Basic Income Public Seminar. I'm Carl Weiderquist. Uh, we will have we will have uh, two speakers uh, today, but we have some we have some sad news uh, that Dirk Vanna, the founder of this institute, has died. Um, and uh, I'm going to have uh, uh, Bernie say a few words about him. Bernie. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Uh, so today, it's really a sad day. Yesterday died um, um, Götz Werner, who is the uh, founding father together with uh, Rector Shiva of the Freebis, of the Freiburg Institute for Basic Income Studies, and even earlier of the Götz Werner Chair of Economic Policy and Constitutional Theory. He was a man very interested in uh, the development of basic income ideas in theory and practice. So he is very responsible for the idea, especially in Freebis, in combining uh, research with advocates, yeah, and to invite the advocates directly into the university. That's a, a really really novel side uh, um, in the Freebis. And this was uh, um, um, promoted heavily by um, Götz Werner. The second thing is, and to this Karl here contributes very successfully is that he always liked to see uh, that we practice teaching and organizing research for young persons. This means for the future of basic income development, <laughs> not only to have uh, sophisticated um, old guys like us, <laughs> but uh, to uh, uh, do a lot for the youth to understand what basic income is and how it could uh, uh, support a societal and social development. So um, um, it's, it's a clear, clear um, uh, problem that we don't have him uh, uh, with us now. And I hope that we will be um, successful to develop uh, basic income ideas yeah, with the background of Götz Werner. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bernie. All right. Now I would like to uh, bring on Louise Hogg, our first our first speaker. Uh, Louise Hogg is a, a professor of philosophy at the University of York in uh, York, in the United Kingdom, uh, and she is um, she is a longtime leader in, uh, in in writing and organizing for basic income. She's written several books and articles on the topic over a course of course of years, a uh, very prolific author. And she has um, also been the chair and co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network for, uh, for, quite, for quite a while and just stepped down a year or two ago. So this is Louise Ha. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Carl and the Institute for inviting me uh, to the seminar series. I'm really honored to be able to speak to you all. So I'm aware that uh, as part of the seminar, uh, um, we chose an article that I wrote quite a long time ago in 2007. Um, and I don't know how many of you uh, have, have read it, but a lot of what I'm going to say today refers to that uh, article and the thoughts I had then. And so there's a little bit of a historical perspective in that sense in my talk, because I'm going to also provide the context for, for what I was thinking then, and, and, and we can be, perhaps discuss uh, to what extent it's still relevant. Um, so I'm going to kick off with 
a couple of caveats just to put that article we're looking at in, in context. Um, so the article that, that's the basis of my talk, it was uh, written in 2007, some time ago. Uh, I was asked to contribute to the first issue of a new journal on philosophical economics, and uh, loosely around uh, development ethics. Uh, and it was a, it was a bit of a spontaneous uh, thought piece uh, at the time. Um, our work has moved on into some more formal propositions and uh, a political development theory around the relation between developmental freedom, democracy, and the state, which is the subject of some of the books I'm currently writing. But um, I'm not going to go into that, uh, but rather I'm going to talk about uh, why I wrote the article uh, of 2007 at the time uh, around an institutional blind spot that I sensed in liberal theory and basic income analysis. And it was really uh, barking me at the time. And of course, one has to bear in mind here that I'm primarily a comparative political economist who works around and, and teaches development and applied ethics in development. So I can't say I'm following the conventions of political theory or the formal study of of ethics in, in the way that I've, uh, I've approached the problems I discuss. But in any case, in the 2007 article on the discussion, I was beginning to formulate uh, my reaction to what I saw as a blind spot in liberal egalitarianism and left libertarianism in terms of the treatment of work and more widely institutions. And so the piece uh, was the first in a series of articles in which uh, I started to explore how basic income can be set broadly within a social democratic paradigm and tradition, acknowledging that this paradigm, of course, has itself been subject to change uh, and continues to, to be so. And I was, I was provoked to, to do so because having come fairly recently to the basic income field in the early 2000s and being strongly supportive of basic income, I could not understand the formal opposition to social democracy or collective institutions of work that kept being reiterated as axiomatic truth, whether in the left libertarian or the rules in defense of basic income. There's not a big uh, uh, group of people that defend uh, basic income from a rules in perspective, but there are some people. And instinctively, uh, this, this counterposition, it seemed to me wrong in the real world, and I began to wonder where it came from. And I concluded that it came from a certain type of commitment to liberal neutrality that generally takes the collective as coercive. And I thought this really had to be dealt with, uh, investigated. So as I said, the debate and my own thinking uh, has moved on a bit since then, but in many ways, the problems I talked about then have to my mind only become more pertinent as the basic income movement has gained ground in what we can describe as a very constrained context of neoliberalism and austerity. And so this, this is the context in which, in terms of applied ethics, it really matters, I think, how basic income is presented in relation to other institutions. And then some of these conceptual trade-offs that I was worried about nearly 15 years ago in the sense that I think they have become even more real than they were then. Um, so in the articles uh, I wrote at that time around basic income and social democracy, I contest uh, this idea of a natural position between the claim for more personal independence and unconditional security and economic equality connected with basic income on the one hand, and the collective, collectivist governance of key human activities, or more precisely, their framing, taking from our reference the Nordic states as a comparative historical case study for sort of ev bringing evidence to bear on, on some of these issues. So what I could not understand was how human activity, work and time were so central to basic income advocacy that were talked about as, as hugely important, and yet they were so institutionally underspecified uh, to my mind. Um, so famously, Philippe van Barish has on many occasions uh, contrasted his left or real libertarianism with social democracy and measures like collective control of work time, for example. Um, and at the time I wrote those articles, then I was beginning to explore deeper differences uh, uh, alongside uh, in my other sort of the other part of my work that's not directly connected with basic income. 
uh, differences between welfare states in terms of their real governance of human activities, uh, also central, as I said, in basic income advocacy, uh, linked with our control of time and work and leisure. And what I found was that the collective governance of those activities, at least in Nordic states, comparably with other states, gave individuals overall more control of time. And then that is, I guess, hard to square with the libertarian neutralist arguments for basic income associated with the dominant defense of uh, Van Parijs, which essentially, as I said, associate social democracy with um, the potential or if not an actual coercive and restrictive paternalist forms of collective governing of time. And so I found that a, a big part of the problem uh, was just prior assumptions grounded in different scholarly traditions that uh, it, from my tradition, much more to do with how institutions actually structure society, whether we like it or not, and therefore we need to focus on their design. On the other hand, uh, more in the liberal libertarian tradition, articles of faith um, that uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, liberal neutrality and a certain view of it, that frankly just seem to carry over and, and are made true by repetition. So I find myself up against a certain abstract commitment to liberal neutrality, uh, development neutrality against the state, uh, and on the one hand, and then this comparative institutional evidence that does not accord with uh, this commitment. So what I, I think we have here is a genuine interdisciplinary challenge, because whether in a pure theoretical basic income society, people could have more control over time than in real life social democracies, is of course difficult to say, and it presents an odd comparison. Um, of course, to my mind, uh, social democracy came very close uh, in the late 70s to, to a basic income conditions like it. Uh, so I, I, I saw that there had been scope for that. But the, 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 the question then is, does the answer uh, to, to the choice between this hypothetical and this real uh, case, does it answer on evidence or just abstract logic? And so here's the interdisciplinary challenge. And interesting, I noticed uh, that Philippe, when uh, he was queried on some of his arguments in, uh, that he made in 1995, uh, for example, the, uh, and the image of the surfer on, on the cover of, of, his, of his 1995 book, uh, in a recent conference in Cambridge a couple of years ago, um, and uh, he rebuffed those questions as about the surfer image or why he chosen that image and so on, uh, since it, it had generated so much opposition. And he said that he never, he never understood why anyone took that image or those arguments literally, that they were not arguments about the real world, but about a hypothetical world. And so this strikes me as actually representing this interdisciplinary challenge that I'm, that I'm talking about and that's, I think, still working itself out. And so... In many ways, this, this is, I guess, a difficulty with my project, which is that I am, or I was, trying to place an institutional political economy lens informed about the real world onto arguments that work in the hypothetical and the simplified. But I, I had to do that, I felt I had to do that because I think against certain deeper realities about human functioning and about social life and historical evidence, many parts of the left libertarian negative construction against collective institutions simply don't stack up. And now, of course, Van Parij's work has moved on and his uh, recent book with Van der Bort, he just as B uh, Bienbaum has done more formally, uh, they made a case for combining basic income with services, where in 1995, Philippe had said that he could see a case for universal services, creches and hospitals and so on, but quote, he could not find any pr principled reason to defend them. Uh, and so he, he clearly has found one, but I still think that Van Parijs and also uh, Birnbaum, to a lesser degree, evade the institutional collectivist question of work and development in Van Parijs case by still pitting basic income as an alternative to work time regulation, just for an, in, for an example. And I, I remember we were at a conference in Florence I think it was 2005, and we were discussing Philippe's book with Yannick when it was just a manuscript. And my main comment then was that, uh, was wh wh why do we need to set up, why do you need to set up basic income as an alternative to the collective governance of, of 
paid work time. Why, why can't we combine these things? Uh, but it's it's still there in in, in the book. The, the the this alternative uh, framework. So I think um, Philippe is saying that through a basic income, our lives can be unaffected by the formal productive sphere, which is one that we can move in and out of without cost, uh, which is a proposition many feminist political economists, of course, have taken issue with. But I think that the problems lie deeper in terms of the way human lives, not just women's lives, but human lives are bounded by certain uh, developmental constraints that I talk about in, in the article. And, uh, and essentially, I argue there are two forces that constrain our control of time, human and systemic, and the basic income cannot remove either of these forces. It can, it can uh, change them, it can uh, improve si the situation, but I don't think the basic income can re remove those, these forces. So in human terms, uh, we need to develop and gain skills, we, we need to learn to cooperate as equals, we need to be cared for, we need to care for others, at times not always of our choosing. We are cognitively constrained by our affiliations that affect how we feel, how we think. Occupations cannot be acquired or sustained without support. Jobs can't just be shared without cost because our skills may be related to them, our experiences and so on. And we age, but we still want to contribute and so on and so forth. And so in the context of these types of innate constraints that we, that we share, um, to retain real control of time, I argue that we need collective arrangements that protect our opportunities so that we do not have to negotiate all of these conditions ourselves, but a, a sense of developmental justice prevails from which we can just take and benefit without having to be strong enough to negotiate uh, every situation and every conflict. So, my argument is essentially that if we're not proactive about these constraints on our independence and our standing as equals throughout a whole lifetime, then our independence and relatedly our developmental liberties will be compromised through our social interactions, even the best will in the world. Um, and I suppose here uh, I'm sympathetic to Anka Gale's case for gender neutral lifestyles in the sense that this is something that needs to be crafted. It doesn't mean that we all have to have the same lifestyles, but it means uh, that we uh, do not have to negotiate our constraints when we choose. So for me, basic income in these terms is very important. It is in fact an institution of developmental liberty in my opinion, but it isn't sufficient. Uh, and so, as already said, I don't think the problems that I describe here are confined in any way to left libertarianism, but that the seeds of those problems are evident in many areas of Anglo-liberal theory, uh, which is why I also talk about roles and Rawlsian perspectives on basic income in the article as flawed as suffering institutional blind spots uh, in, 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 in that 2007 article. Uh, and, and I point to tensions in Rawls. I mean, Rawls on the one hand, uh, is, of course, recognizes developmental liberty in one sense uh, in terms of his Aristotelian principle, motivation and fellowship. Uh, but he, he doesn't develop it in institutional terms uh, and even goes against it in some parts of his work, and as I discuss in the article. So, so essentially in that article and other articles, I argue that human activity and its connection with well-being is a blind spot in liberal theory and it carries over into liberal, liberal egalitarian thought and into many areas of basic income analysis. Um, and some of the debates we focus on, Rawls versus Nozick and then left libertarians and so on, actually some of those protagonists actually share some uh, prima facie assumptions that are problematic, even though we usually thought, think of these figures as opposing each other. And so in terms of applied ethics, then, how, uh, the, how I think we should judge political circumstances, and that's also as activists and active scholars and so on, is informed then by what I think is a more broad-based account of the connection between human function and freedom and economic institutions. And we cannot afford to be too loose in our compromises in order to get basic income properly accepted. And that, that has been something I've said uh, for a long time, and it has got me into trouble uh, sometimes. Um, 
And you'll no doubt object in a moment, uh, asking questions that basic income advocates, again, talk a lot about work and time and do not take our control of these for granted. And that is true. Uh, but I'm still going to argue that whether for opportune or for formal reasons, and I think the discourse to a certain extent have become entwined in, in terms of the opportune and, and the formal, there is this uh, growing tendency to talk about these things in too voluntarist, too hopeful terms, perhaps. Uh, and so, although basic income advocates made human activity central in claims for basic income, like the possibility to control work time and care, and the relationship between these, to me, for me, this is done in a way that too much rests on basic income alone. And of course, you can argue that, well, let's leave all that aside, and at least just get basic income in first, uh, and I, 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 I don't disagree with that, uh, but I, I, I don't. I think we shouldn't wait to, to talk about these problems until uh, that happens. Um, uh, and in particular, I don't think, of course, that this I refer to as mono institutionalization of basic income needs to be an implication of a case for basic income at all. Uh, and that making it an implication has serious pitfalls uh, then in reality. And so in that article, then I wanted to clarify what an alternative case for basic income uh, in terms of control of activities that does take real structural constraints into account might look like. And I come to oppose that then to what we might call the more singular case. And in the broadest terms, a singular case, I think there are many manifestations of that, but it's one in which basic income is central within the social and economic system or, or is sufficient in, in, in any case. Uh, and uh, I think sometimes singularity is mild. It's just a case of a focus of activism that has become issue-based against certain constraints and opportunities. Uh, and so that's at the level of discourse and action. Um, uh, in a recent article, I also argue, incidentally, that singularity and a compensatory focus in basic income analysis has roots, very deep roots, in anti-liberal history in terms of reaction to high inequality. Uh, Carl, of course, has argued that uh, it is notable that basic income enters the scene when there is a crisis, when high inequality becomes politicized. And I, I think that's not an accident. In other cases uh, that I'm, I'm interested in, in the article, uh, singularity is a theoretical proposition. It's not just a political phenomenon, uh, analytical one. Um, and so an example of that that I already might have hinted at is, that, is when political theories talk about what a basic income society might look like. When, to my mind, from an institutional perspective, this is a false construction. So a basic income is an institution, and it's an important one, but it's not an institution that can define a society per se because per se, that's just too much else going on, okay? And around the time that I wrote this article, I'd just been to a conference in Oxford titled The Basic Income Society. So I, you know, I was primed by that. And, and I do remember that one of the arguments I made there in that conference um, was that the case for basic income uh, on grounds that it increases mm. autonomy uh, and so we can remake the world was much more plausible then, or before then, before neoliberalism, and much less plausible after it. And so essentially, libertarians uh, in, in the 80s or in back in the 70s uh, were able to take stable institutions for granted and yet ignore them analytically. You know? And now we don't have that luxury. We, we don't have that luxury. So uh, therefore, that's one of the reasons I think um, some of the arguments are made then, whether they're completely right or wrong, but I think it's still relevant. Um, so I argue that singularity derives justification at a theoretical level from different areas of liberal theory that are committed to liberal neutrality in a sort of ex-ante unexamined way, in a way that disguises or outright rejects the structuring of choices by the state or wider collective forces that we can't escape. We can't escape them, but we can shape them, uh, I think. Um, and so um, to make my critique and also highlight the sort of shape of an alternative, more broad-based case for basic income in institutional terms, I made the proposition in the article for what I call the developmental freedom-based welfare governance. And I said that this included basic income, shared welfare, and the promotion of occupational stability 
not the guarantee, but the promotion of occupational stability uh, by society. So I suppose I was anticipating the addition of, of universal services that was then has now become axiomatic, uh, but I, I, I still think it isn't enough. So in summary, if I got five minutes, uh, loosely based on the article, I made essentially three points. So first, I highlight the institutional blind spot in liberal egalitarian theory that I argue is not been helped by the frequent reliance by liberal egalitarians on neoclassical economic arguments about the natural market supply and demand of jobs and the pricing of work. I think, for instance, Philippe does has relied on that. Uh, I argue also that even the new social contractual paradigm around duty-based reciprocity, which is often represented as the opposite to basic income, such as represented in Stuart White's work on the civic minimum, uh, that I, you know, it's now uh, some time ago, but it, which incorporates a sort of market contractual idea of work that goes against developmental freedom as a superior uh, value. And, and I, I discuss uh, that in the book. And of course, Stuart White has since changed his mind, I think, and is much more supportive of basic income now. And second, uh, so in the article, I present reasons why a more substantive notion of developmental freedom is helpful to bring to light the institutional problems and constraints on redistributive policies and on basic income as a standalone institution. And third, uh, I discuss how in the light of uh, institutional and cooperative constraints on freedom that make certain wider forms of sharing risk pertinent and important, that we can make a defense of basic income that is in a word more demanding and that has the wider question of an ordered economy in view but an ordered economy that is different to the punitive policies some associate, I think not quite accurately, uh, descriptively or normatively, to the idea of an economic order, for example, in the guise of social democracy. So just to make clear in the article, I make reference, and it's even the title, I make reference to social order, partly to raise the stakes of my argument and in a sense to be provocative, because in one way I, I wanted, I still want to challenge uh, the idea, ideal of an unordered and unpatterned world within neutralist and libertarian arguments in general and, and for basic income specifically. Uh, that of course has been, I think, very, very influential, not, not the only argument, but influential. So we can uh, go back to Hayek, for example, and uh, it, it, of course in a well-known passage defended a subsistence guarantee uh, that we, we we say that he's all, also a sort of defender of, of a form of basic income. Uh, but he also said uh, that the world is unordered. Uh, so one morning he had breakfast in New York and he got an epiphany that the contents of his breakfast was, was so varied, you know, the sausages and the eggs or whatever it came, uh, they were so varied in, in source that no one could have possibly planned it, you know, they, where they came from, how they were priced and so on. And from that, he derived that there are no, and we should not think of patterns in the world, because doing so is to go against natural forces, and that's coercion. Of course, that was part, that was his critique of roles as well. And so Hayek's, uh, that was informed, no six critique of roles rather. And so Hayek's project was to um, expand the sphere of the possible, whatever that is, against the coercion of the regulated. Um, and so this meant that he had to will away shared constraints and our collective interest in developing overall better institutions, at least from my perspective as an institutional economist, he had to wish all that away. So now one reason I mentioned Rawls then in the article is that of course, he recognized developmental liberty, as I said, as a, as a thing and a good uh, in his characterization of developmental motivation and its companion principle and that we enjoy fellowship and so on in the carrying out of our plans and, and the things that we do. But Rawls, he also did seem to think that it was possible to arrange background institutions of basic equality of opportunities against which then dynamic outcomes would be tolerable. And I argue in the article that his, his countervailing difference principle, uh, which was a form of correction of inequalities, was, was very vague and imprecise. And of course, a later defense of basic income on a Rawlsian premise also pits basic income against the idea that we must enter world of collective production. I'm thinking of uh, Patriona McKinnon's defense, also published in Basic Income Studies at about the same time, 2007, I think. Now, I think Van Parish performed a trick by saying that the difference principle could be read in terms of 
entitlement to leisure, then which would justify a basic income to work that Rawls could recognize. But um, if we are to take Rawls' Aristotelian principle seriously, I think this will not do because they can only really be manifest under arrangements where making and sticking to plans and forms of fellowship in society are possible. And again, a basic income isn't enough for that. And so in the article, I try to square the circle by making two arguments. First, I argue that a cooperative order like social democracy does not have to have the punity implications that Stuart White seemed to suggest in his civic minimum. And in later articles I've, sh articles I've shown that comparably, social democracy has still, has been and even still is less punitive, although it's more punitive now than it was, and far more vis-a-vis uh, -vis the unemployed uh, than the anti-liberal states. And I also argue that this uh, suggests that actual equality in society is constructed by institutions, uh, as in the Nordic case, it's a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Institutions that stabilize opportunities in many spheres, care, leisure, occupation, uh, and income, and, and the combination of these. Uh, and, and so I think there is an underlying logic to the way that social democratic welfare institutions did become less conditional in comparative terms, as we saw, especially in the 70s and early 80s, uh, and, and even carrying over from then. Uh, I mean, uh, we're talking about unemployed persons notionally uh, having to claim entitlement that wasn't a basic income, but could do so for seven years without any really real uh, harassment um, back back in, in those days. And then, of course, that has been rolled back. Um, and I also think that the, the, the Nordic states, just looking at history long term, they, they, they show that actually quality promotes unconditionality. So even if basic income was never implemented in the Nordic states, uh, states like Norway, Denmark, and Finland, and more so than Sweden, they approach conditions of unconditionality, as I said before, when equality through these other institutions was higher. Um, so I think when, when Klaus Offer famously has referred to the overburdening of European states in the late 70s, which was really his case for post-work, post-work paradigm, uh, which is also relevant, this overburdening to, to the Nordic states, I don't think it was quite as relevant to the Nordic states, precisely because they had expanded equality uh, through institutions into the domain of leisure and care in a way that Germany had not done. Uh, and that also shaped how they dealt with neoliberalism. Um, uh, not, la not last, or not in terms of the, so, sorry, in terms of the defense uh, then of basic income, uh, for me, looking at the Nordic states in comparison, the implication is that we can see basic income as an institution that broadly fits social democratic principles of solidarity in human development, uh, and that without basic income, uh, control of time and activities in other institutions uh, is strained, as neoliberalism has proven. So uh, for that reason, I also disagree with many activists in Nordic states now who see a basic income as an extension of flex security in Nordic states. So flex security is the acceptance of more precarious work in exchange for basic security, yeah, flex security. Uh, and this to me was, to my mind, uh, in any case, was, was always a sort of Faustian bargain that was struck in the 90s. It was a birth child of the Nordic version of neoliberalism in a way that the Nordic state was Anglified uh, and flex security was a corruption of social democracy by neoliberalism. Uh, under flex security, the punitive conditionalities uh, arose really for the first time. I mean, implemented certainly in Denmark, uh, my birth country, uh, in a way that they hadn't uh, existed before. Uh, and even when they are more humanist in implementation, so for example, in Denmark, you will kick, there's a limit to how much your uh, benefits can be cut, whereas in the U, U, United Kingdom, they can be cut entirely for a number of years and you can be cast outside of society completely. Uh, you know, there's this difference. Uh, they are still a breach with the social democratic humanist tradition. Uh, so when in the articles I wrote in the, in the late 2000s, I made this notional defense of basic income within the terms of an altered social democratic model, I was not thinking of any form of social democratic or Nordic model, because as I said, there has, there has been a change and a corruption. 
but rather I was making in terms of first the real historical evidence we have that collectivizing human development conditions tend towards a basic income, not away from it. And also in terms of the prospect uh, of um, conditions for real control of time prevailing in conditions under which development freedom is recognized as a superior standard for the design of, of, of our institutions. And thereby I end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Louise. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have uh, some students who are ready to respond. Uh, Julie, are you ready? Yes, Professor. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I ju just have some uh, questions to, uh, to ask, uh, and that's all. Uh, so the first one goes, uh, in the paper, it is said that the influence of the automatic account on liberal uh, egalitarian thought has produced an ambitious, imprecise, and in the case of welfare uh, contractualism, a coercive account of both individual freedom and social com community. Mm -hmm. So uh, this might not be the smartest question you get, but I couldn't uh, fully understand what it means. Could you please elaborate? <laughs> how, how long time? How much time have you got? <laughs> so uh, in terms of the welfare contractualist argument, um, I think I illustrated that sort of in, in quite a lot of depth, it, just by taking Stuart White's the civic minimum, um, where, you know, the, I can't remember the precise suggestion, but there is the suggestion that somehow parents need to be punished if they can't uh, provide for their children, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, for example. So to me, that's, that's a punitive, or that is a very strange punitive implication uh, of the uh, of sort of a reciprocity argument that that doesn't need to be there, but it's there because, because Stuart White, in fact, relies, I think, on the market contractualist paradigm in the end that, you know, we derive our income from our labor and that's the only place we, we should or can derive it. And if we don't, we can be punished because we've taken on responsibilities of the children. I mean, um, I think if he hadn't adopted the market contractualist paradigm, he couldn't have made that punitive implication implication and I, I mean later on I think Stuart White has changed his mind in in light of neoliberalism he, he can now see that that is wrong because with the precarization of jobs you can no longer hold parents responsible I mean I don't think you could I mean actually responsible but I don't think you could ever hold them responsible in principle anyway so you know I, I don't agree with him anyway um, in terms of the atomistic account of human nature I mean the market contractualist paradigm is an atomistic account of human nature because it, 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 it tells us that we relate to others and, and square bargain and keep promises to others, et cetera, through contracts in the market. And of course, in actual real life, we have a range of commitments that make up our whole being and our whole identity and our existential being and so on. Uh, so that's, that's the atomistic account of human nature. And, and um, I mean, I think just, just to egg the pudding. I mean, I think even, even Rawls, it's, I take Rawls because he's someone who you'd think doesn't do that, but I think even Rawls in a way um, does that, um, partly where, where he talks about um, uh, the, the, the pricing of work as being some sort of somehow market-based and then needs to be compensated for. But actually there are ways in which we can organize employment and paid activity that is fairer. We don't have to do it the market way, right? I mean, we and we should combine that with a basic income, in my opinion. It's not organized employment properly or a basic income, it's organized employment properly and a basic income. And then, then you are recognizing more fully all of the aspects of our being. I don't know if that helps, but. Yeah, it, it does, surely. Uh, the other one goes, uh, if the realistic, uh, realistic adoption of uh, liberal neutrality was adopted, what would have happened in that case? And uh, what is the idealistic adoption of new uh, liberal neutrality? Is that something in the article? Yeah. Did I say idealistic or realistic? 
Or is that something you just, terms that you just introduced, just so I know? Because I haven't read, I haven't reread the whole article. I'm just wondering, did I say that? Well, yeah, I guess, according to my understanding, maybe. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, well, this is very, very complicated. I mean, the whole the whole question of liberal neutrality, what it means, is very complicated because it can mean a lot of different things. And I do, I do think that under this sort of market contractual paradigm, very generally in in, in, in anglo liberal liberal thought, uh, liberal neutrality has been sort of taken to, and in particular, it's been taken by libertarians as uh, as sort of their preserve. You know, but actual liberal neutrality can just mean impartiality. Uh, you know, in in hiring practices or merit, you know, meritocracy in the, in, in, in in giving of exam results or whatever. I mean, liberal neutrality is sort of pervasive, but I think that the neutralism, you know, or liberal neutrality in that guise is is your hike or your no seek. That is, uh, in, is 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 the idea that the state is always coercive. This is the idea of the breakfast, as I say. I mean, if you try to not not just make patterns but if you try if if you if you start looking for or recognize patterns you are already inviting coercion because then you have to respond to them and then the state has to be active and then it, individuals choices are not as open as they might be and blah 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 um so i mean that is neutralism as a sort of ex ante let's not examine this let's not examine this and but i think it's all i mean it i think it is in Rawls, I think it is in Van Paris. Van Paris is always saying, oh, liberal neutrality, I mustn't go against. And he doesn't actually explain where and when it ends or begins. And the same with Rawls, he says, well, priority of liberty, obviously priority of liberty. You know, but in what sense priority of liberty? Where, how, which aspect of liberty? Because there's all, there are conflicts between different forms of liberty, right, in reality. And so I just think there is this almost mystical, mystified idea of priority of liberty and anti-state um, discourse uh, around this this uh, liberal neutralism. Yeah, the, uh, that's it. Thank you for your words. Uh, it really helped. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, and now Mar Marvin Roche has uh, Marvin Roche has some comments, right, Marvin? Yep. Um, I only have one point, and. Um, it's it's about I mean this article is about um, work and labor and its implications for how we live and how we are and I mean what it does to us on an individual level and to our society and how that is intertwined if I understood it right mm. and um, I think this is a really curious um, part of UBI a very central part and. Uh, what I stumbled upon in your article, which is um, you also said that in this talk now that um, a part of the article is assumptions, misconce misconceptions that um, both sides in the discourse sort of just um, accept, like neoliberal assumptions, and that that is a mistake. And that there was one particular one um, that you called the misconception of a work-leisure trade-off. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, if I understood that correctly, that is something I would strongly challenge because even if we become this society where everybody um, enjoys their work and um, can incorporate these different elements that are important for individual well being, even then I think there is still a trade off between uh, leisure time and work. And so. Um, yeah, maybe you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. But I mean, this is again, theories appropriate words, and then they become to mean they they come to mean what those theories defined them to mean. So I mean, the, the leisure work trade off uh, really in in applied in applied economics in applied uh, ethics and neoliberal theory means something specific. It means. Um, people will always prefer leisure to work and therefore they must be made to work. That's what it means. And that justifies, you know, low income benefits. It justifies, you know, the argument don't make people too, too secure because they'll take advantage, blah, blah, blah. But of course, I agree. There is a trade-off between too much work and leisure and, and there's trade-offs between forms of time. What I'm arguing for is to frame 
our institutions and social interactions in, on, on, a, on a macro scale in such a way that people can make choices that don't become trade-offs between those forms of time. So for example, what one issue I, I, sli- I had a slight issue with, there's a, there's a book, I uh, forgot his name now, but it's about unstructured time. So it's about this idea that there should be a certain amount of time that we should all have that's unstructured. Uh, um, and, um, and this could be like an, a day a week or four hours a day or whatever. And I just, I just remember thinking, well, that's all very well. But if the other areas of time are totally coerced and stressed, then A, you can't take your unstructured time and B, you can't enjoy it. So what I'm, I think what I'm trying to argue is that we do need to reflect as a society on how the different activities that we all end up doing in different degrees are generally structured in the, in the society so that we can enjoy all the different forms of time. I don't buy that just by choosing to do more of one or more or less of the other in an unstructured world, we have control because I, we might not have control of the way we're doing things in that time, the way we work, the way we care, uh, uh, may be traded off um, by, you know, unhappiness or stress in the other areas. So, and, and so that's why I think basic income does contribute to giving us more control of our choices and of our time. Um, when we can do things, how we, when we can make choices, etc. But I don't think it gives us full control over the content of the of that time or the social relations in, in those forms of time. Um, in that case, I would like to follow up quickly um, because I think there is some forms of labor and work, no matter how you structure them, where people would always choose leisure over that particular job. That might be different for different people, but um, I, I think you might also agree that there are some forms of labor where people definitely going to choose leisure every time, even if yeah, it's well, but that's why we labor. Need, we need good incentives for people to do that job, so that you know, you know, people shouldn't be forced to do those jobs out of necessity. That's why basic income is important. But it, you know, it's also important, you know, assuming in the real world the basic income isn't going to be enough to live a fully full life, you know, because I think we, we have to look at the reality that maybe at the end of the day, maybe once we've tested basic, tried, t- tasted basic income, once we've tried it, we might want more and more of it. And maybe one day we will have a basic income society. I don't know. It's a bit like communism. Maybe one day we'll be in a society where we can fish in the afternoon and hunt in the morning or whatever. But I don't think we get there by just imagining it and then transitioning through some sort of revolution. We, we get there by um, actually living by some of the values through institutions we create that, that uh, enable that, that kind of way of being. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I can't remember what you're, what you're oh yeah, so there's always gonna be things we don't wanna do. We are, well, I mean, as far as possible, we should not compel people to do things. So we should use incentives. And so that's that's why I still think that organizing work and paying people properly or thinking about how people can be made incentivized to do things is important. We can't just leave it to the market. I might follow up again. Mm. Um, that would be a very nice, the point I made would be a very nice argument for a UBI because it would give the negotiating power to people to... Um, for example, get really well paid for these jobs that um, nobody wants to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that. I think uh, it depends on the level of basic income. I really do think it depends on the level. And I'm just a bit skeptical that we are going to get, in reality, to a decent level for some time, sadly. And I think that think what what is important now, you know, as an activist, I've said what's really important uh, is to try and tell people why it still matters to have that status equality. Even if basic income can't fulfill everything we want it to, that, that it brings about a status equality we haven't had. And that has many um, ramifications uh, that I think are really important for making other changes. So I, I agree with that, but I just don't see it being high enough for a while. 
I don't know. I'll be here, interested to know what Carl thinks about that. Let's well, ask him. I, I, yeah, I don't know what uh, uh, I don't know what the future holds for getting legislation passed, getting getting politics to change. Um, uh, 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 my specialty is not in predicting that kind of thing. And I think most of the people who do predict on that don't have a very good record of being correct when they do. My, my, um, uh, my concern is that we push in the right direction and we take any victory, large and small, we can get. Yeah. Going for the small victory, I think, is sometimes a mistake. Because you say, well, there's less in uh, our critics to oppose if we go for something very, very small step in this direction. That is true. There is less for our critics to oppose. But also, there is less reason for our supporters to get out there on the streets and mm-hmm. say, we have to do this. Mm-hmm. People, people will, will push and push hard for something that's going to change their lives, not a small gimmick to progress. Yeah, yeah. So we've got to be pushing. Mm-hmm. We've got to be pushing for this. But I do believe We've got to be pushing for the full, full thing, but sadly, we'll probably have to compromise along the way and start out with some smaller things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you got to take heart in a in a daily victory. We've had too many defeats. Well, I uh, just I've, no, no, I agree. I, I just personally found it hugely frustrating being from a Nordic state. You know, I mm-hmm. I know I know why a lot of Nordic people are fearful of basic income, and it's because of the way we we have presented the case against social democracy. I just have it's been very important to me to demonstrate that this is an unnecessary opposition. And there are people who think that these two these things have been and can be compatible. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have uh, Dritan with his hand up. Go ahead, Dritan. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, uh, you mentioned uh, incentives and uh, you know, th- that's some kind of nudging uh, from, from the government. Yeah, and uh, from this point of view, I guess we are teaching people preferences and not uh, abilities uh, to correctly assess the risks and estimate uh, the probability from an unfortunate event and the policy implications that come out of it. So uh, we may... Uh, make people more parasitic and uh, put them in a in a situation where they expect uh, that uh, government would lead them towards a particular way. I totally disagree with you. Well, thank you for your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That was. Uh, uh, I needed some clarif- clarification on that. Well, I mean, I, I just, I just don't think. First of all, I don't think there's any evidence for that. So you know, this is really important. I mean. If we take the Nordic states, yeah, as, as you know, that they would be your cl- classic parasites then, right? I mean, the Nordic population would be your classic parasites. But, you know, if, if you look at public opinion or values in those states, they are the least conformist. You know, so, so there, there's, there's really very little evidence that more security, more collectivist uh, action make people conformist. It may make people, it, it, may, it may make people buy into these collective goods, but in terms of the range of interests or ideas or you know, that people have or the, the 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 values that they hold, we, we don't uh, we, we we don't see that. And and in terms of whether people work, um, I think as a survey was done and uh, on on work values, there was zero point zero two percent that said that they wouldn't bother to work if they had you know security. It's, it's just the, so the evidence isn't there. But I mean the other thing that's problematic from what you're saying is. It assumes that we can teach people to assess risks and probabilities in the marketplace in the bigger society. Of course, we can't teach something that people can't do ever. So to me, that's a completely red herring. I mean, and in any case, um, it's also false that the more we marketize, you know, um, the more open our possibilities become. I mean, look at the stock market. Right. How many people are there? How many people participate there? And, and how many people understand the risks and probabilities there? So, A, it's totally hierarchical and B, it's totally opaque. And so our society, uh, we as citizens need 
structured information, but not, not from a mono state, but you know, from a very vibrant, pluralistic uh, research based, politically active society. But that's not what you get in a market context. There you just get less information, complete opaqueness, and this very idea that nothing is nothing can be planned or organized in the world, which is, you know, it's frankly dangerous. It's an anti-scientific proposition. Okay, uh, Bernie, you're next. Yeah, thank you for your very interesting contribution, Louis. I have only a, a very, very short comment. <laughs> First of all, I uh, looked at my manuscripts when I taught yeah, in my basic income lecture for the last time, the aspect of punitive justice. Yeah? <laughs> I was very inspired by you to uh, teach that one once again, because it's more than five or six years yeah, <laughs> away. And the reason for that is that no one was interested in the punitive justice of basic income. Yeah? It's, a, it's a lost gimmick. I do not know why, but it is very important. And you uh, um, uh, uh, presented here some ideas about how to uh, put this again into the logic. A second concerning the Nordic model, and uh, that what I call, uh, as we do it in Germany, the German market economy approach is from our point of view, the Nordic model seems to be more cooperative, living together, whereas in Germany, we believe strictly in the competitive economy. Mm -hmm. And concerning the competitive economy means that we have to believe more in labor income in market income than in other kinds of income. So therefore, because I'm an auto liberalist, I was also very nearby Hayek um, and uh, many others here in the Freiburg tradition. I completely left that argument when I, and that's important for me, inspected basic income more heavily, yeah, that you see that competition is uh, what we could say the macho organization, the male version of the economy, and if we add to this care, yeah, care economy, then we have a more female <laughs> institutional idea about what work really is. And therefore, no wonder why in Germany, the care economy is on the one hand very expensive, but on the other hand, clearly underdeveloped. Um, a, a, a fourth remark is, what the, neo, uh, uh, what the neoliberals or the libertarians take care about, the, what I would call, and what my colleague also, Mr. Feinberg, called very often as a scholar of Hayek, is the enabling state with respect to the protective state. Not the productive state in the interest of James Buchanan and other contractarians, or the redistributive state, but a protective state. With that, yeah. <laughs> um, it's allowed for the neoliberal, uh, for the libertarian government to be highly coercive if someone tries to uh, um, uh, do something against the protective state in the sense of um, um, a private property. Yeah? Therefore, you see, again, in these states, we are not interested as a self-fulfilling pro uh, prophecy in common pool or common property organizations. A very big mistake in Germany also. Mm -hmm. My last argument is, uh, I do not know if I understood you quite right, because you said in, in neoclassical economics, in the uh, a neoclassical model, we have a leisure work trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it is not a leisure work trade-off because one is the residual of the other. Yeah? <laughs> for me, it's a trade-off between market income and leisure, because market <laughs> income in a composite commodity gives you utility and leisure gives you utility. And because leisure gives you utility, that's also your consequence. Work can be only a bad, a private bad, not a public good. Therefore, and my solution to your question is straightforward, I will publish a paper with, with an assistant. Uh, we are finalizing the paper at the moment where we show that the old fashioned tradition in economics, the thinking in economics is that uh, with consumption, this means um, labor income and on the other hand work, we have additive separability, yeah? Work is effort, work is bad and has to be compensated by the wage. 
And all what is good is consumption of goods, consumption of leisure time. In our model, we switch to multiplicative. That's what we call time sovereign, multiplicative uh, uh, combination of um, labor time, unearned work, and creative leisure time. And then uh, the world totally changed. So my argument is, it is a very important part of basic income that it socializes individuals towards more control, individual control of time towards time sovereignty. Mm -hmm. One interesting, my last argument on that, one interesting aspect is in our model that we can show that some tax bases, yeah, uh, uh, don't show the level curve anymore. It's not a hump shape. For example, the consumption tax, yes, increases whenever the basic income tax increases. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is, um, uh, you could say, an asymptotical development towards uh, the maximum amount, but never a level curve. And that's a very interesting result of the basic income socialization. What do you think about that? That's my only question. The other <laughs> things are more or less hints you may ignore or you may might find fruitful. No, no, I, I mean, just hugely interesting uh, comments. Um, really, really interesting reflections there as well. I, I need to think more about it and take that on board. But the, uh, the laugh occurred in basic income socialization. I'm 100% sure I follow you because we don't have basic income socialization as yet. So do you mean just in theory? Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. We, 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 we don't have evidence because we don't have a state with basic income. <laughs> yeah, so therefore, there is only, so to speak, the uh, armchair, theoretical armchair evidence that when we uh, argue that a basic income serves for time sovereignty, then one can show it in a multiplicative yeah, time usage model. Yeah, incorporating consumption time, yeah, consumption of goods. And mm -hmm. then we see that the level curve, at least for some tax bases, is vanishing. And that was a surprise, and it's very interesting for me to recognize that. So this means that it is relatively easy to, um, um, con uh, to, to, um, to um, finance a basic income when the basic income socialization towards time sovereignty works. Yeah, that's a theor to, to wholly theoretical argument at the moment. Not well, a, I don't know. I don't know if this, no, no, I don't know if this is an answer, but would you just make me think, uh, again, I come back to the Nordic states because Nordic states have, I think, a kind of unique combination of uh, low uh, average working hours. I mean, Holland is, is does better. But the problem with Holland is that the gender distribution of the work time is so unequal um, that, well, uh, there, there seems to be, um, uh, sorry, it, an implication because of the way work is, because work time is not collectively reduced, but reduced through part-time work, primarily taken by women, it's, it's, we don't have a whole system sort of um, experiment. But in, in the Nordic countries, we have a very high um, uh, equal distribution of informal, so time, uh, household tasks. It's, it, the gender distribution of household tasks is, I think, the most equal in the Nordic states, or at least some of them. At the same time, you have a low level of working hours and high, so high levels of, of leisure. And you have a very high level of socialization of resources of income. So the social wage is a, a very high level of GDP. So I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't exactly amount to basic income, but I think um, what it shows to me, and I don't know, if we, had, if we had a basic income society, as I said before, where we are able to tax machines or we're able to tax something and then distribute it all, what would things look like? Now, that's hard to say, but in Nordic yeah. states, by whatever means, we have organized a situation in which we have a very high level of socialization of income. It might not be just in the, in the you know, redistributive income, but also because um, the way in which income is distributed through the tax system is more egalitarian and so on and so forth. Um, so we have a situation that, that could resemble 
the situation you're talking about. Does that make sense? I'm not. Oh, I'm not yeah, sure. yeah. I think a very interesting hint for me to see if I can uh, uh, draw from that some um, um, some empirical evidence. Thank sure. you very much. That's very important. But just to mention, mm -hmm. Ugo Colombino, uh, he made some uh, estimates about which <laughs> countries could afford a basic income. Oh, thank you very much. I stay in touch with Ugo. Thank you. Yeah, I did. Never minded this. So. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Louise, thank you very much. Uh, this ends uh, the, the seminar with Louise. We'll now take a five minute break uh, and resume before 11, uh, before uh, 5.15 for Otto Leto. Uh, thanks a lot, Louise, and see you all in five minutes. Carl? Oh. Yes? Are you, are you still on, Carl? Yes. Yeah, the recording is off for Europe. Now, I was just going to say, I, I would like to stay and listen to some of Otto's presentation, but I will have to leave in the middle. It's not because I, I, it's boring or yeah. you just have to go and pick up my son. So, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 thanks for sticking around. Okay. okay.
Okay. Uh, Otto, are you there? Here I am. Okay, great. Um, and you know how to share your screen when you need to put that table up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we are going to start again. Uh, do you need to signal me, Tobias, or are we uh, good to go? Sorry, what did you say? Uh, do you need to signal me to start again, or, or, or we're fine on the- No, we can start. start, we can start. We're still online. Okay, okay great. All right, I'll start my recording again. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're running a little bit behind, but we have our next speaker ready to go. Um, Otto, Otto is a former guest scholar here at uh, the Goetz Vanna Chair and at uh, the Freiburg Institute of Basic Income Studies. He has now uh, moved on to take up another guest position in the United States and comes to us from there right now. He's going to speak on libertarian perspectives on basic income. Go ahead, Otto. Well, thank you very much. And yes, indeed, it's good to see some of you, um, some of you for the first time, others for uh, for for another time. Uh, but I today want to provide kind of an overview of potential arguments for basic income from the libertarian point of view. And of course, to do that in 20 minutes is not quite possible due to the rich diversity of views within this, what I consider to be a family tree of, of uh, positions and arguments and ideologies. And indeed, what I want to emphasize today is this diversity and to sparse it out, because as an analytical philosopher, I like to make categories and I like to uh, distinguish between useful um, lines or useful divisions. And I think Within the libertarian family, there are some useful divisions that will also, I think, be useful for students to think about in terms of differentiating arguments for and against basic income. Um, but I think the first thing to do, if I can actually, um, uh, because inspired by, by Louis's very interesting talk, um, I would like to share just one um, uh, screen here. So this is, um, this is the... Um, Economic Freedom Index of 2021. Um, and so of course at the top you have usual suspects like Singapore, New Zealand and Australia. But if you go a bit further down, you will see that you know, countries like Denmark, Iceland, or my own country, Finland are very high up on the list. So in some ways, you, know, you could say this is the result of the neoliberalization, if you will, uh, and you can debate the effects of it, but it, it, it is true that the so-called Nordic model has also changed a lot throughout the years. And in fact, um, many of the Nordic countries are more libertarian in the economic sense than, for example, United States. Um, okay, so I think the important thing here is to is to do some divisions, as I, like I said. So let's. So the the structure of my talk today will be first. I will give sort of an overview of what is a libertarian argument for basic income. Then I will um, discuss two types primary types of libertarian arguments. First, rights-based arguments, sometimes called deontological arguments, and then the consequentialist arguments or arguments that focus on the consequences of different institutions and rights, um, and especially utilitarian type arguments that focus on the welfare consequences of different rights, including the rights to freedom, extensive freedom. Um, okay, and so let me begin by going through kind of what I consider to be the definition of a libertarian argument. I mean, I think first thing to realize is basically anybody can make use and, and many people do make use of libertarian arguments. So for example, Guy Standing, a very famous uh, basic income researcher who also presented here uh, as part of this uh, seminar uh, earlier, uses a lot of freedom-based arguments. Um, he argues that basic income advances the freedom of poor people. Um, but at the same time, I, I wouldn't consider, I wouldn't call himself, uh, call him a, a libertarian because he, when the push comes to shove, um, put some other moral values such as equality or fairness above the maximization of 
personal, social, and market freedom. So I think only if someone systematically prioritizes libertarian arguments over competing arguments, and if one systematically prioritizes the value of liberty over most or all other competing values, uh, whatever the reasons for doing so can be called a libertarian, or as I would also um, prefer to call them, radical liberal. So I think a radical liberal is someone um, who is a who is a libertarian um, uh, in this broad category of, of 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 terms. And of course, you have kind of mixed forms. You can have people who are a little bit socialist, a little bit libertarian, people who are a little, little bit conservative, a little bit libertarian. But I think it's um, those those mixed forms. Um, are not what I'm concerned about here. So I think libertarian is a radical liberal, someone who holds liberty as the highest moral, political, and or economic value. Um, so I, I don't think that libertarianism should be reduced to this sort of caricature form of someone who thinks that taxation is theft and therefore um, there's no rule rule for redistribution. It's it's perfectly possible to be a libertarian and and be more of a moderate libertarian and think that there is some room for redistribution as long as one prioritizes liberty as uh, as the most or one of the most important values um, in the in the ordering of values. So I think at minimum a libertarian is someone who both in the realm of, of private social actions, that is people's lifestyle choices and so on, and in their economic actions and choices, uh, supports widespread freedom for all people equally. So at the minimum, a libertarian supports widespread individual freedom, support for uh, voluntary contractual arrangements, um, markets, private property rights, opposition to arbitrary and tyrannical government power, and so on. So these are kind of the, the basic building blocks of what constitutes a libertarian argument or a libertarian um, person. Okay. So originally the word libertarian actually originated in, I think in France and certainly in the European circles of left-wing anarchism, but in the 20th century, it became associated with the, with the more sort of um, United States notion of, um, of uh, especially right-wing libertarianism, um, but it has since become sort of associated with any, any form of this radical liberalism. But in Europe, libertarians are still often better called liberals, and indeed there are many liberal parties and liberal institutes, and I think that's, that's the more appropriate term to use in many European contexts. Um, and so um, libertarians in this sense can be uh, differentiated from some other types of liberals with prefixes like classical liberal or market liberal or even conservative liberal, although I think the latter of those is not very helpful. Um, so, and in politics, like I said, uh, the, the spreading of ideas of uh, support for individual freedom, support for limited government, markets, private property rights, and opposition to discretionary and arbitrary government power can fit into various forms and you know uh, people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher has, have been called like libertarian but you know they in many ways were not particularly libertarian for example in their social views they advocated for rather conservative positions so they are best categorized as this mixed form of libertarian uh, conservatives or conservative libertarians um, in the same way in the Nordic countries we have uh, kind of social, social liberal or social democratic um, libertarians, if you will, who are, who are willing to combine extensive market freedom with, uh, with, uh, with some form of, uh, of, of a limited welfare state. So in the family tree of libertarianism, um, there are also, so just to preface my, 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 um, my division here, although I divide the libertarian arguments into rights-based arguments on the one hand and consequentialist arguments. On the other hand, I, there is also the field of, um, of, the, of the category of cont contractarian or social contract arguments of which James Buchanan's Democrat model is um, a good example. But I have discussed that elsewhere. And if you are interested in the contractarian side of libertarianism, I highly recommend that you um, go look at my lectures for freebies on this topic of Buchanan's Democrat. So I will leave that aside and focus today on the rights-based arguments and consequentialist arguments. Um, and in the family tree of libertarianism, 
um, on on another dimension, you can you can think of them as as how much room they are willing to countenance to the state. So at the one extreme, you have extreme anarchists who believe that um, maximizing freedom means having no state at all. Um, moving a little bit towards um, support for the state, you have the so-called minimal state theor theorists or night watchman state libertarians, such as Robert Nozick and Murray Rothbard, um, for whom there is, uh, there is a case for a minimal state that protects private property rights, um, supports uh, the courts and the police and the army, but otherwise does not engage in redistribution. Uh, for those categories, that the, the pre two categories that I mentioned, it's very hard to support basic income, although in some cases um, that are rather rare and unexceptional, they might, at least the minimal state libertarians might be used to justify basic income. For example, in Robert Nozick's case, if one reads um, some of his principles, um, um, uh, as giving weight to historical injustices, for example, that might justify implementing a temporary basic income scheme to rectify them. But uh, more usually, the, the support for basic income starts when we move even a bit further towards kind of the moderate um, classical liberals or market liberals of whom people like Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek are perhaps the most famous and their contemporary followers, such as the bleeding heart libertarians, uh, so-called bleeding heart libertarians like Matsulinsky and Michael Munger, for whom some amount of limited redistribution and perhaps other welfare state measures is justified and uh, especially support for basic income has been proposed uh, by, uh, by all, all of the people that I mentioned in some form or another. And then of course you have um, people like, well, Carl Weidequist and, um, and people like that who are on the associated broadly with the, with the sort of left libertarian side of the argument or on the margins of it, at the borders of it. Um, you have people like Henry George, Hiller Steiner, Philip van Paris and Carl Weidequist, um, who base their arguments on the value of, of liberty and the compensation for the liberty lost in, uh, in the institution of the private property system, but who otherwise support uh, wide scale uh, individual freedom for people, although they reach, um, you know, even, even within this category, there are many differences of, of what exactly that entails. So um, let me now turn to the rights-based libertarian arguments. Um, so again, I, I want to emphasize that I'm not providing here my view, although that, that, was, that was very tempting to me to say, here is my preferred way. I should perhaps come clear out of the closet and say I am more sympathetic to the consequentialist arguments for widespread individual freedom. And those are the ones that I will discuss the last. But I think also the libertarian arguments for UBI um, can be rather intuitively appealing and worth considering. So I think the prima facie opposition that comes from right-based libertarianism to basic income can be easily understood if one understands that a right-based libertarian believes that individuals have some rights that cannot be violated for the sake of the collective good or for the sake of the welfare of other people. So in Anarchy State and Utopia, Robert Nozick famously sets out the prima facie right libertarian case against redistribution when he writes that uh, this is the first sentence of the book. Individuals have rights, and there are no uh, there are things no person or group may do to them without violating those rights. Um, and indeed, he continues: there are only individual people, different individual people with their own individual lives. Using one of those people for the benefit of others uses him and benefits the other. To use a person this way does not sufficiently respect and take account of the fact that he is a separate person, that his is the only life he has. Now from this, Nozick argues that redistributive taxation is on par with forced labor. Now, um, there are other libertarians who have taken Nozick's argument and actually said that if you take seriously the separateness of persons, the fact that the right to life is, is the primary right that uh, people have, whether because they're born with it or whatever, um, so-called natural rights, um, uh, you might still justify some form of redistribution, at least under 
some circumstances. So Eric Mack, for example, Eric Mack is, a, is another right libertarian who has um, given the following example. These examples are discussed at length at my paper with Miranda Fleischer um, on libertarian perspectives on basic income published in the International Handbook of, of Basic Income, the Bulgrave International Handbook of Basic Income. So I highly recommend you look at that because that goes through all of these classifications and gives, gives you a more detailed look into this family tree of libertarian arguments. But Eric Mack um, argues, gives the following example of um, the freezing hiker. So what is the freezing hiker example? So, um, so imagine a hiker who, through no fault of her own, encounters unpredicted and fatally cold conditions. She happens upon a locked but unoccupied cabin. If she enters, its shelter, fire and blankets will save her life. An absolutist conception of property rights holds that she must honor the cabin owner's property rights, even at the cost of her own life. Mac counters that no plausible moral theory, including no plausible libertarian moral theory, would require the faultless hiker to sacrifice her own life in this manner. To insist otherwise, according to Mack, would be to deny the essential premise of Nozick's argument that each individual is a separate person, that hers is the only life that she has, and that she cannot be forced to relinquish that life for others. The freezing hiker cannot be compelled, according to Eric Mack, to sacrifice her life, her only life that she has, solely because an absolutist conception of property rights demands that um, those property rights be respected. So letting the freezing hiker die in the cold would conceivably be a violation of the oppressor's right, right to life. Similarly, Mark argues that a homeless person who trespasses in a garage or shelter or steals food from a backyard garden to survive um, has the right to do so under certain conditions because a moral theory based on the separateness of persons must allow individuals who in dire circumstances through no fault of their own have to engage in self-protection. So it seems that if people have the natural right to protect their life, and the only way they can protect their life is to steal or damage other people's private property, they have the libertarian right to do so, because the right to life is a primordial right that the individuals have. So in the famous libertarian slogan, going back to John Locke, life, liberty, and property, life comes first. And this is no accident, because the right to life is the most important one. And if it comes into conflict with any non-essential right to property, the latter must yield for the sake of the former. So this seems to suggest that there's some support from the right libertarian point of view to, um, to support for redistribution in certain cases, but the, some conditions have to be met. Um, so for example, it remains unclear if the freezing hiker has the duty to compensate the damages done to the property owner after she has recovered and ceased to be in danger. This may depend on several factors like whether they engage in reckless self-endangerment or whether they were indeed in trouble to no fault of their own, uh, whether the violation of property was proportionate to the need that they had, um, whether compensation would ruin the financial situation of the hiker and a few other factors. Uh, furthermore, in order for this freezing hiker example to generalize to the whole society and to justify a large-scale program of redistribution like basic income, it must be the case that conditions similar to the freezing hiker scenario or the starving beggar scenario are widespread in the society. They cannot be simply isolated examples because then that wouldn't justify a large-scale program like basic income. And whether these scenarios actually do generalize depends on accepting something similar to G.A. Cohen's or Carl Weidequist's argument, empirical assessment of the relative lack of freedom of poor people in rich industrialized societies. Okay, but even if, if, if we do, do accept these empirical arguments that they do generalize for the whole society, um, libertarians do not have to abandon libertarianism as a moral and political philosophy. They only need to support something like basic income or something similar as a requirement of justice or as a side constraint to the system of widespread economic and social freedom. Nor do they have to support the welfare state beyond it. Now, um, a related argument from the rights perspective is the Lockean argument, but I, I won't go through it. Uh, here, except very briefly, because that has been also discussed in the seminar before. But um, 
you know, according to John Locke, people have the right to unilaterally appropriate land and resources, but it may be that this appropriation uh, uh, falls foul to a couple of the provisors or limits that Locke places on this. So the first one actually um, is the so-called spoilish proviso. It states that property owners cannot accumulate resources in a way that causes good resources to go to waste. Uh, the reason is that appropriation is only justified when it leads to productive economic activities and wasting resources is not a productive activity. So if I have good apples in my storage that are about to go to waste, but I cannot consume them all by my own, nor am I willing to sell them or give them away for to others, uh, and there are people around who are starving, I have lost my title, my property title to those apples because I have let them go to waste. Um, so poor people have a claim of justice, as Locke emphasized in the first treatise of government, um, uh, and not just a plea of charity, but a claim of right uh, for the excess of other people's resources. Um, but Locke argues that this proviso does not necessarily apply in a complex industrial society where people can sell their apples in the market. Um, and therefore, if they sell their apples to the market, they have already relinquished their duty to to, uh, to let other people uh, steal their <laughs> apples or appropriate them for themselves because they can simply buy them from the market, according to Locke. Um, and of course, the famous enough and as good proviso, um, which is another side constraint on appropriation. But you know, as people like Carl Waterquist and uh, uh, Henry George and others have pointed out, even in by Locke's own standards, uh, this property, this proviso is currently violated all the time. Um, but um, this has all been discussed in the seminar, so I will leave it here, except to say that it seems that the principle of unilateral appropriation without some compensation from purely Lockean grounds can be said to lead to the property less effectively becoming served to the landowners, which would be unjustifiable under some circumstances, which might justify something like basic income. Um, and the whole category of left libertarian arguments um, then follow this line of argument and develop it into different directions. Um, so the, the last of the, of the rights arguments that I wish to discuss very briefly is Robert Nozick's argument about historical injustices that I already briefly mentioned earlier. So Nozick argued that uh, people have the right to appropriate on Lockean grounds, but if it can be shown that past appropriation was not legitimate, then the title of all subsequent transactions uh, from that original historical point are not justified. And if we can show that in the past property was acquired through theft or other illegitimate means, for example, by violating the Lockean provisos, then we can justify current redistribution as a rectifying measure and indeed as a requirement of justice to um, uh, to correct for those historical injustices. Then the, then the empirical question becomes, were those original appropriations done according to justice or were they based on, on theft and thievery and robbery and murder and all those things that you often see in history? Okay, but let me now move to the consequentialist arguments. So the consequentialist libertarian or classical liberal arguments argue that um, a system of widespread individual freedom and limited government um, is, can be justified on the basis of the good consequences that they are expected or supposed to have. A good example, or the, perhaps the most influential historically of this, is David Hume's argument and also his friend Adam Smith's argument that um, under certain assumptions, a system of um, private property rights and, and free markets produces great advances in social wealth and also the satisfaction of, of um, consumers. So examples of this are Adam Smith's argument for the invisible hand mechanism of the market in the wealth of nations, and also David Hume's argument for the fixed rules of justice in his inquiry concerning the principles of morals. More contemporary examples of this include Hayek's and Friedman's arguments for a free society driven by economic competition um, and their argument that a system of fixed rules of property can be used to increase social output, put scarce resources into better use, facilitate entrepreneurial innovation and ultimately consumer and citizen satisfaction. 
And there are different varieties of this argument. And, and again, this, this is a sub branch of the tree with many different branches, many different varieties. Um, but already David Hume argued in his principles of inquiry concerning the principles of morals that although it seems that fixed rules of property so that everybody sort of has, has a good idea of what they own, they can make voluntary transactions with others to, to, to make contracts, to, 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 um, to improve their lot and to contribute to social welfare, they are good for society. But it is obvious that such rules, and this is a quote from him, um, it is impossible for those rules to prevent all particular hardships or make beneficial consequences result from every individual case. So if we have this kind of abstract system of rules of justice, it's clear that some people will suffer. Adam Smith also argued that, for example, the division of labor and the private property system that supports it produce great uh, increases in wealth and innovation and so on, but you know it can cause create hardship to individuals, for example, who have to do monotonous work or who, who are engaged in the sort of envy towards the rich or other forms of kind of positional goods pursuit, which are bad for them and bad for society. And so there might be a case for remedying those issues uh, because what we are concerned about from the consequentialist point of view are the consequences of, of, um, of our policies and our actions. Uh, so Hume did not advocate for systematic compensation. Um, Adam Smith uh, argued for some forms of, uh, of support for public goods and for, uh, for education and a few other uh, um, uh, areas of, of, like, uh, of support from the government, but not for basic income or anything close to it. But more contemporary thinkers like Hayek and Friedman have argued for something similar to basic income or a negative income tax in, in Friedman's case. Uh, for somewhat similar reasons. They argue that social flourishing, social flourishing or long-term social welfare is best guaranteed under a system of fixed rules of private property rights and free markets and so on, although with some room also for various public regulations and services. Um, um, but, um, but nonetheless, there might be a case for providing a social insurance scheme, which sort of helps the system to gain public support because it takes care of some of the hardships that people inevitably have to face when under the system they they uh, lose their jobs or they lose their source of income you know or the very many different ways in which this abstract impersonal system of rules um, produces bad consequences for them in the in the short run so um um So, um, so now let me get close to, to my conclusion here. So why would someone like Milton Friedman or Friedrich Hayek support something like basic income? Well, like I said, it's a matter of understanding that um, if you want to have redistribution uh, from, the, from the point of view of, of, of facilitating market transactions, facilitating uh, innovation and facilitating the flourishing of social, social welfare, um, on the basis of the free and open society, you want to have the rules of redistribution be designed in ways that support individual freedom, both social freedom and economic freedom. And so, for example, Friedman argues that um, if there is to be a program to alleviate poverty, it should be directed at the poor, not at you know, this interest group here, this interest group there, not to farmers, students and so on, but to everybody to have the same rules for everybody, to minimize privileges and to grant the same rights of, to freedom to everybody. Um, and therefore, something like basic income might be a good way to do that and also to substitute for a wide variety of programs. And this is what differentiates libertarian arguments from many others. They argue that the basic income should be used to substitute for most, if not all, of the existing subsidies to various groups like farm subsidies, student subsidies, uh, minimum wage laws, uh, tariffs, uh, professional licensure regulations, and so on, and um, and, um, and and therefore be a, a broad general substitute for the existing welfare state measures. Um, and of course, it supports it, it. It supports the market system in also the way that, as Hayek emphasized, the price system with its capacity to convey signals to people uh, is very good at 
um, at uh, uh, taking advantage of local and dispersed knowledge. And this is the famous argument of, of Hayek for the epistemic properties or the knowledge producing properties of markets. And therefore something like basic income respects the price system because it gives people cash, which they can use on whatever they want. It gives them the freedom to, to experiment, to innovate, to deviate from established norms and to pursue different lifestyles or to pursue different um, uh, consumption patterns or production patterns in the economy. Um, so it, it is therefore very clear and transparent and supporting of the market. This is what the order liberals have called mar market conformity or conformity to the market and competitive order. So um, to conclude, um, I think, Many libertarian variants, variants, although many of them are also hostile to basic income, can be used to support, if any support is to be given to redistribution, to something like basic income. Um, and so whether one accepts right-based arguments or, or contractarian arguments or consequentialist arguments, it seems that a preferred method of libertarian redistribution is through unrestricted, unconditional cash transfers that minimize administrative bloat and therefore um, the sort of tyrannical powers of the welfare bureaucracy and also support the capacity of poor people and all people really to have a fixed set of rules under which they can operate and make spontaneous choices without the control of people from the outside. And in contrast to in-kind or targeted transfers, un unrestricted cash transfers are good at furthering individual autonomy by recognizing that individuals, even poor ones, are often better just judges of their needs than the government uh, or their bosses in the, in, the, in the companies in which they work. And since libertarians are skeptical of the abilities of the government to exercise wise discretionary power, decoupling redistributive transfers from work requirements acknowledges the inability of the government to distinguish the deserving from the undeserving or the needy from the unneedy in a principled way. In this way, a libertarian basic income grants basic security to all citizens, supports their social and economic freedom, and limits the bureaucratic power of the government. Although it may have its problems and worries from the libertarian point of view, most notably its uh, tendency to impose a strong tax burden, these might be tolerable under certain models and a basic income is almost certainly better than what, what many uh, governments or welfare states have now from the libertarian point of view. And it may even be a moral requirement of justice if one accepts that libertarianism um, provides such a moral theory of justice. Uh, so finally, I think the best libertarian case for basic income derives from the combined uh, sort of consequentialist and, and epistemic considerations that the bureaucratic administrative state is the nemesis of a free society um, because it falls vic victim to the problems of, of how do you plan a complex economy. It gives incentives for people to rent seek or to take advantage of the system for themselves to get some money for themselves at the expense of others. It therefore wastes a lot of resources. Um, and it also gives power to people to who think that they can rule over others um, to, to control the lives of others and to micromanage the lives of especially poor people, which is the antithesis of a free society. Uh, it seems that the freedom of poor people is not sufficiently respected in today's society. It is unfair that some people, whether it's welfare state bureaucrats or business owners, have excessive freedom over others to command them to do their bidding. And the social safety net, therefore, from this point of view, should be designed to support, not undermine, individual freedom in the marketplace and in the civil society, which requires giving people unconditional cash payments as the best available option. So I think I will leave it at that. Um, and um, I will put on, on the screen a, a hopefully helpful sort of um, summary of, of what I have argued here, which goes through some of the most important rights-based and consequentialist libertarian arguments. So it doesn't introduce any new ones, but it simply summarizes what I have discussed here so far. But with that, I will conclude. So thank you. You're muted, Carl.
I'm reading this table. So I am, uh, uh, I'm, I'm taking a minute here to read the table before I call on anyone. All right. Um, uh, I believe uh, Chowanan has yes. uh, prepared some comments. Please go go ahead, Chowanan. Yes, thank you very much, Otto, and thanks for your sharing. Uh, I have two points to discuss according to the paper on libertarian perspectives on basic income. And firstly, admittedly, libertarian libertarianism are quite doubtful about the government's ability of exercising redistributive transfers. Also, the government's failure to recognize the individual's need of ca cash transfer. But what if people are confronted with some emergency situations, such as natural disasters, terrorism, or conflicts? In these cases, governments need to do their job by the means of emergency cash transfer. So my first question is, to what extent would the UBI scheme would help ensure individuals' life safety or property protection, and by which way? And secondly, in the pa uh, according to the paper, I noticed that uh, uh, by, by the contra contractarian theories, uh, which you haven't mentioned, in this presentation, but it doesn't matter. I noticed that uh, the safety nets mentioned by the contractarian theories uh, supports the idea of redistribution because the safety nets, which is similar to the network of forced hypothetical exchanges, as you have mentioned in the paper, uh, it makes Pareto superior move to a well off or even better off level for each person than he was with natural endowments. So which indicates that we also need governmental redistribution to convince the low endowment people to accept a social system with strong property rights. Uh, that's, that's my, that's my, uh, that, that, that's what I have, uh, uh, understand from your uh, from uh, reading your paper. So this idea conflicts with libertarianism or proponent idea, uh, as I have mentioned above. So the second question is uh, whether a wider UBI scheme should include a safety net system, as as it has mentioned in uh, by the contractarian theories. So that's my uh, two points. I would like to raise up yes thanks oh thank you very much um yes the contractarian position um is is something i left out but um it's something i've obviously discussed in the paper and also in my other papers on james buchanan um and the you know it seems that uh, when one takes this contractarian point of view um, it really depends on the assumptions that people have going into the, into the hypothetical scenario about where they will end up in the society that they choose from behind the veil of ignorance uh, in the, in the contractarian uh, 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 original position, as Roll calls it. So it really depends on if people assume that under this kind of right system, for example, be it, let's say, minimal state libertarianism, they would end up um, in, a, in a position that they would feel happy with or they would expect to be um, happy with. Um, if they are very risk averse, they will choose a society with a very strong safety net. If they, um, if they are skeptical towards the power of markets, they will uh, allocate more power to, to governmental economic decision making. Uh, and so if the libertarian system or some ver version of it is chosen, um, perhaps with a basic income uh, behind the veil of ignorance, um, it will have to satisfy um, the the ascent of 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 of, uh, of all people, and in this sense, you know, uh, I think Carl is very right to focus on the pursuit of a cord 
as the sort of um, ideal, I think, you know, I, I see it as sort of a continuation of the contractarian. He probably sees it as slightly sort of an alternative to it. But at, at any rate, the, the pursuit of a court or the pursuit of a contract, which is really acceptable to everybody, um, uh, is, I think, a very powerful way of thinking about the justification for something like libertarianism. Now, I think that behind the veil of ignorance, if people uh, come to think that uh, system of robust private property rights, uh, uh, healthy respect for individual and social freedom and so on, is the one that would make the majority of people, right, or in the ideal case, everybody better off, that's what they would choose. And if they have something like a basic income as a support system, I think that would be a, a way to, in a way, buy people's assent or to get more and more people signed up for the system if they realize that even if things go wrong, they have something to fall back on. Okay, so that's that. That's my answer to the question of social contract. And now let me uh, briefly discuss the question of emergency measures and 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 how to deal with crisis. Now, this is something I have written about in a recent paper, which I highly recommend you read, uh, available in open access if you Google it, uh, which I think is called Permanent Crisis Management, the Rule of Law and Universal Basic Income. And in this paper, I argue that emergency measures can also be divided into two categories. There are rule-based emergency measures, and then there are discretionary or targeted emergency measures. And if we have something like basic income in place, that constitutes part of the rule-based re crisis responsiveness of a society, because it corresponds to an automatic rule-based uh, uh, safety net or support mechanism for people who, who happen to fall through um, uh, tough times. In this sense, basic income is best understood as a sort of a firm foundation for surviving through a, an uncertain and complex environment where people face lots of challenges and include some major crises. But whether it's enough, I don't think it's enough on its own. So I think moments of crisis probably call for some combination of rule-based responses or this kind of automatic safety nets and also more targeted and discretionary measures. And so, therefore, I think that some hardcore libertarian positions would have to be compromised in crisis situations. And so I think, you know, whether it's natural emergency or war, uh, it seems that um, one has to not only have something like basic income and private property rights and the rule of law in place, but also some mechanism for empowering, hopefully temporarily, and hopefully within some limits, some uh, emergency authorities to implement some targeted transfers on top or targeted measures, regulations, and so on. Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would you like to follow up, Shauna? Uh, no, no, not anymore. Yeah, I think. Thank you very much. Solve my problem. Thanks. Solve my questions. Um, uh, Okay, I have a question from uh, I have a question from the uh, comments section, uh, a written question from Hans Florian Hoyer. Uh, it says, "Would, from a libertarian point of view, a separate type of money (parentheses dividend) be feasible to organize the participation in what everybody needs all the time? Would a separate type of money be?" feasible to organize the participation in what everybody needs all the time. So I'm not sure if I completely understand the question, but if I, if I take it to be asking um, whether something like, whether, whether it's sort of, sort of what I answered, I think, to Chauna, perhaps in terms of, do I think basic income alone would be enough? I think under many circumstances, it would be actually an improvement over a situation where you have uh, sort of a very active government that doesn't have any fixed policy in place or no automatic mechanism, but is always trying to sort of one up the situation to outsmart the new circumstances. I think it's very good to have some stable mechanism in place. And I think um, it, it is feasible to have such a mechanism. And um, if we have a stable mechanism, we can be clear about what the costs are going to be. Of course, they're going to be higher if the economic productivity is higher or if more people are without jobs but you can predict and expect a system to be able to uh, withstand many shocks, but not all of them. So I think that 
it's probably necessary to have some combination of policies. But I, I don't know if that was actually the, the question that you asked, but that's the best mm -hmm. I can do. Yeah, I was a little unclear on, on that myself. Uh, now, let, let me make some comments here. Uh, I don't identify as a libertarian, but I, I am certainly a student of libertarianism. I've, I've read a, a lot of libertarian authors, and it is really interesting, the relationship between basic income and libertarianism, because based on the dispositions of most people who identify as libertarian, which I might call right libertarian or propertarian, uh, but often prefer to call themselves libertarian, uh, simply libertarian, uh, and but but also with the, the broad, broader natural rights approach to property rights that stretches back to Locke. But in this tradition, there's a strong disposition against against redistribution of income. Um, and there is, uh, and, and even when there is to be redistribution of income, there should be very little of it, it should be very low. The, the benefit should be, uh, should be a very ungenerous. And that is a large part of the tradition feels that way. So those I think are the biggest negatives, but on the positive side is that, is especially from the consequentialist side, uh, is that, that when there is redistribution, it just makes so much sense from this perspective that it should come in the form of cash and unconditional. Uh, so in that sense, there's a predestination towards policies like basic income. And you got that explicitly, um, explicit arguments from, from Friedman and Buchanan, especially from Buchanan in his argument uh, for a, a single tax and a single redistributive program, which would be a full, a, a, a true universal basic income, not a negative income tax. Um, and then the, but the other thing I think from within the, within the really strict confines of the right libertarian ideal is the, is the Lockean proviso. A lot of libertarians have brought up the proviso just to say, oh, it's, it's fulfilled and not really taking their own principle very seriously. But if you take that principle seriously, you don't really need to change, you don't really need to change the theory at all. Just go with this consequentialist idea that cash is usually best, unconditional cash is usually best, and take a look, say, we're really gonna take this proviso seriously. We're gonna research it and see what takes to fulfill it and not just say, with no research whatsoever, oh, I think it's fulfilled, therefore we'll never look at it. Um, they actually take it seriously. You would find actually there is a tremendous case from within this right libertarian movement to say, yeah, we should have a, a very substantial basic income. You think out of Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I agree on, on, on all of those points. I mean, I think mm -hmm. um, it's, I think I, I want to highlight that the, I think most of the best libertarian arguments today are consequentialist, or at least have a very strong consequentialist component, um, not just for basic income, but for liberty itself. Um, and so I think the, the emphasis on rights-based arguments, you know, this as a consequentialist, this is my prejudice, but has been detrimental to the discourse. Um, but um, if um, I think the I think the important thing here is that both consequentialists and so-called deontological or rights-based um, uh, libertarians would see that rights are important. Uh, it's just that one of them sees rights as innate or natural, and the other sees them as either conventions or social constructs or the results of a social contract. And, um, uh, and so there's a big difference between seeing, for example, a regime of private property rights as being natural, uh, in which case very little can be done to, to violate it or being a sort of social construct construct or, or social convention. If you see them in conventional terms as David Hume does or Adam Smith does or Friedrich Hayek does, then there's much room for thinking about what the precise form of the system of rights and system of liberty should be. And that also opens up the debate for something like basic income much mm -hmm. more naturally. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's interesting that you to me that you brought up well, my theory and how it fits in with this, and I think you, you got it correctly, that uh, I 
position myself and think of myself as a critic of both contractarianism and libertarianism. However, my criticisms of both of them tend to be internal criticisms. So saying not that there's anything wrong with these principles, that the idea of minimizing minimizing negative interference with people is a very good idea, but that it's not being delivered by these so-called libertarian mechanisms as envisioned. Uh, and we have to do something else to deliver it. And so now, but, but on, and on that side, I could consider to, to be considered to fall within the libertarian camp because I believe that it is possible to deliver something. It is possible to deliver a lot more freedom than we have. However, uh, that makes me outside of the camp because I reject some of their, their primary, their primary ideas of how we should go about it. That, that private, specifically private property rights is going to envision this with very little uh, regulation or redistribution. And I really reject those ideas. And I think really libertarianism is defined more by that disposition towards these policies than it is towards a commitment to the principles that supposed, so supposedly underlie it. I don't think that Cohen was right when he said that those deep principles were where the action is. I think where the action is, is what policies people envision. Um, and the principles, they're often trying to cook those to get the policies that they want. So in that sense, I'm a big, uh, I, I'm a, I reject the libertarian tradition. I don't identify as any form of libertarian. However, there are people from within the tradition, such as uh, Kevin Carson and, and, and Rodney Long, who I find myself agreeing with all the time, even though they're still using this name. And they're making some of the same criticisms I am of the center. They're still using this term. Um, so, and similar with me now on social contract theory, I, I say, I like what you're trying to do. You do not deliver it and you cannot deliver it. That no institution, no set of institutions really delivers the contract, the social contract idea. Um, so in that case, it's a, it's a bigger rejection. But I think those failures and both of those that even though you can get an argument for basic income from within the, the libertarian ideal, I think once when you see its failure, the failure of the contraction and the, the contractarian and the libertarian things to meet the provisos they've set up to justify those, um, rejecting those gives gives a very strong the strongest case for basic income. That's great. Um, I think that's a very helpful uh, clarification of of, um, of your position in relation to this, and uh, and partially just a matter mm -hmm. of I think of subjective preference mm -hmm. and kind of like taste even of uh, how one should choose to 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 identify oneself and uh, um, and um, you know emotional and personality dispositions also go into it for for a lot of people into what they identify with. But you know, um, I, th I think the I think you you are right in saying that. Libertarianism today is not just commitment to um, uh, to lack of negative interference, but it is almost always correlated with an empirical assessment of the types of institutions under which those principles are best um, uh, justified. Now, I don't think this is a necessary one. I think I think we should be moving in the direction where we actually um, go deeper and just uh, um, and, and and think about very freely about what those institutions might be. So, you know, I, I think that, for example, if somebody could convince me that a system of based primarily on community property or public property would have better consequences for, for not just public welfare, but also individual freedom, then I would, um, I would support those. And I, and, and, and I also do support, <laughs> I do, I have to uh, have to say, support a system, which is a mixed system um, which has private property, public property and common property uh, as part of its framework but it's just a matter of which should we which should we prioritize because of the expected consequences of those those framework and and um, but I, but I think that any libertarianism has to have some strong respect for private property if private property is understood as a private sphere of 
of uh, of of uh, resource ownership and in this sense i think even even your uh, model has uh, has the basic income um, as as the private property of the people who have it uh, because they they have the right to exclude others from from access mm-hmm. to to it yeah i do agree that there are there are times and there are times and places and in ways in which having those kind of rights are advantageous to people. It, um, but I would put many more restrictions on it than your, your, typical, your typical libertarian would. And it's much, to me, it's much more how much common public and private property you need is very much uh, an empirical question. Uh, but it's also one that has to balance balance the duties imposed when anytime you, you, you make a choice between those institutions, you're imposing duties on, on individuals, not just giving freedom to the ones who get to control the property, but imposing on duties on the ones who don't. We have to take seriously the repercussions of that. And I don't think even most left libertarian theories do that sufficiently. That's great. I, I agree with all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, do we have a uh, 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 Otto and I have gotten into our own little conversation here. Uh, do we have anyone else who would uh, who would like to uh, ask a question before we're we're out of time? Okay. Well, we have used our fifty five minute hour uh, anyway. So uh, thank you very much, Otto. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for everyone who participated. Um, and we'll go back to a private session on Friday. Uh, with just the regular participants, um, but that will be recorded for broadcasting later. So you'll, the rest of you, if you won't be able to participate live, but we'll be able to, to watch it later. So thanks a lot, Otto. And thank uh, you. Thank you so much.